the inflation rate or CPI rate is much higher than the growth rate of wages and salaries. And at the same time, it's much lower than the growth rate of profits of late. And so the only way to explain Larry Summers and Jay Powell's interest in raising rates, which works essentially by throwing more people out of work, is that they're trying to tame labor. The only reason that we have capitalist firms now is because capitalists have been able to keep capital itself in short supply and thus to demand higher rents to use their capital. And among the higher rents that they charge are effectively, they say, we have to own the firms and we employ you rather than you employing us. But as soon as we recognize that a sort of money shortage is an engineered shortage, then you also recognize that we can engineer it in the opposite direction. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. My co-host Patricia is away at the Scottonomics Festival doing great things as we record this. But to console me in her absence, I'm delighted to welcome back to the show Edward Cornell, Professor of Law, Public Finance Consultant, author of many great articles and books, including The Citizen's Ledger, Digitizing Our Money, Democratizing Our Finance. It's my great pleasure once again to welcome back to the show, Professor Robert Hockett. Hi, Robert. Hey, Christian. Thanks so much. It's always a delight to be with you. These are always the most stimulating conversations that I have, uh, at least at my end. So I'm honored and thrilled and grateful. Thanks so much for having me on again. No, oh, vice versa. So, Robert, You've been ahead of the curve for years now in terms of urging policymakers to make the banking system serve the public rather than the other way around. And in your recent Forbes piece, How to Spark a Nationwide Main Street Industrial Renewal, you do a great job of scene setting and you write about this timeline of how banking moved from regional and specific and focused on the real economy to being focused on speculation and the financialized economy, bringing some of your own experience into that as well. Can you walk us through that history? Yeah, sure, Christian. It's actually quite intriguing, especially if anybody's halfway nerdy in the way that I am. So back in the mid to late 1990s, I was somewhat less nerdy and a little bit more of a sort of hipster. I was a student and lived in Kansas City. And I wish I could say that I was ahead of my time in being in Kansas City in the late mid 90s because I was going to be meeting Stephanie Bell or some of the other folk over at UMKC like Randy Ray or Michael Hudson. But in fact, I didn't know anything about any of that stuff back then. I was, again, a student and a sort of an amateur social worker spending a good bit of time living under a bridge, camping out with a bunch of homeless friends who were unbanked because they didn't have addresses. And I had started this sort of shoebox bank experiment, as I called it, where I was essentially providing a way for in, in which or through which my friends could save up money by essentially putting money in shoeboxes and initialing ledgers whenever they came up to my apartment that I still had to, say, use the shower or to borrow clothes to go and in for a job interview or whatever. So I was a little interested in banking in that sense as something that ordinary folk didn't see, or I should say underprivileged folk or not well-to-do folk sometimes just didn't even have access to. But apart from that, I really wasn't much of a banking type at all. But I did notice one thing around that time, and that was there had been a couple of very regionally focused banks that accordingly had lots of regionally resonant imagery that they used in their logos and their signs and the like. And 
because this was in Missouri, two of these banks that you intended to see around a lot were called the Mark Twain Bank on the one hand, and then the Boatman's Bank on the other hand. And the logos would be steamboats with paddle wheels and smokestacks, all that kind of thing. As it happens, of course, Hyman Minsky was actually on the board of the Mark Twain Bank. But again, I wouldn't have known who that is back in those days. In any event, I did my banking there insofar as I had any money to bank. And one day in, I think it was 96 or 97 thereabouts, I was walking along and I saw some gents on a on a ladder taking down the sign in front of the Boatman's Bank and replacing it. And they replaced it with this very generic looking, boring, plain vanilla sign, red, white, and blue with the name Nations Bank, which didn't have any particular resonance or state or local resonance at all. It was just like essentially an American bank, right? <laughs> Rather than a local bank. Yeah, Imperial Bank of North America or something like that. Or, you know, Death Star Bank for the nation, which is itself a Death Star. Um, and then a couple of years after that, the nation bank sign itself came down. It was replaced with a, an equally a generic red, white, and blue sign that said Bank of America. And there we are to this very day. <laughs> the even bigger Death Star Bank. <laughs> <laughs> exactly the mega mega death star. Yeah, I mean, I think it's. I think actually, in terms of deposits under management or total liabilities, Bank of America is actually the second largest banking institution in the world at this point. I suppose it's fitting for anything named America in part. I was sort of curious about this, but again, I didn't really pursue it or anything like that because my primary interest in anything that you might think of as banking was my little shoebox bank for my little friends. But it did get me thinking about how if I do end up becoming a law student one day, God forbid, maybe I would look into banking law and financial law and basically the bodies of law that sort of determine what happens in this particular space. That, of course, ultimately did happen. I did end up becoming a law student and a finance student, and I became then something of a student of banking law and financial law. And I had always been something of a history buff as well, that sort of early American history. And there was a really interesting sort of intersection, I suppose you could say, between my sort of history interests on the one hand and then the eventually evolving banking law interest on the other. And it was basically as follows. Um, I sort of learned something that many people already you know, had known for a long time and that many people know now, which is that the U.S. actually had a fairly lengthy and uh, venerable tradition as a polity and as a culture and as a legal culture, for that matter, that reflected a great deal of suspicion toward large aggregations of financial capital. We were much more focused, in other words, on production, on, on the real economy than we were on financial wheeler dealing in our first 230 years or so as a polity. And that seems partly to stem from the status of the founders of the American Republic, and many of them were slave owners, the reason which is quite disgusting, but I guess we could all stipulate that. But one reason that they were slave owners was that they were plantation owners, and you can't actually farm a plantation without having a large labor force. And you can't make a lot of money off of that, I guess, in those days without exploiting labor, even to the point of not paying them at all. And in any event, so these founders, people like Jefferson and Madison and quite a few others in the Piedmont Delta region along the east coast of the U.S., were agriculturalists. And the reason that ends up being significant for our purposes is, as you know, it's fairly difficult to predict the weather even today. And meteorological sophistication was even less, I suppose, back in the 1770s or 1780s or whatever. And so farmers often fell prey to stochastic changes in the climate that would make crops fail. Significant for the founding of the U.S. and for U.S. banking culture was that all of these people, when they had these crop failures, suddenly found themselves unable to pay massive debts that they owed to big London banking houses. And in some cases, Amsterdam banking houses as well. The reason for that in turn was, of course, the British Empire didn't permit its colonists to have their own banks. It didn't permit banking to be a sort of indigenous or local sort of homegrown industry and preferred that the colonials, including wealthy oligarchical plantation owners, be dependent on London banking houses. So one consequence of this, I think, was the founders of the American Republic felt a great deal of resentment right, toward large banks and also to large sort of metropolitan areas or metropoles that were banking centers. Um, and that sort of animus or that sort of suspicion or experience led into or fed into a longstanding American legal and cultural tradition of 
essentially keeping financial institutions small and local and sort of production focused, you might say. So we didn't have nationally chartered banks until the 1860s. Banks were state chartered. And even when we did start offering national bank charters, we required within the same enactment, the Banking Act of 1864, for the nationally chartered banks essentially to follow the same rules as the state banks did. And that meant that they too then had to stay focused. They couldn't branch across state lines. And so you didn't have large aggregations of financial power, at least in the commercial banking sector, um, for many, many decades of American history. But when all of that began to change was in the mid-late 1990s. And these changes are essentially what underwrote or underlay the experiences that I mentioned a moment ago, right? So the enactment known to American banking scholars as the regal Neal Act or the regal Neal Interstate Banking and Branching Efficiency Act of 1994 removed those interstate branching and interstate banking restrictions pursuant to a sort of a two or three year timetable so that by 1997, um, the banks began to spill over state borders and began to consolidate and merge. And basically, we had many fewer banks by the end of the 1990s than, than we had before. And that was, in effect, what I was witnessing back in my sort of hipster days. And then the other great change, of course, that came with 1999 was the repeal in the Graham Leach Bliley Act or the Graham Leach Bliley Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999. Thanks for giving it the full title there, because there'll be people writing in. Yes. What's that? <laughs> yeah. And what that did, of course, it, it repealed, among other things, it repealed Glass-Steagall. And what that in turn then was that you could actually form large financial conglomerates that combined garden variety, plain vanilla banking on the one hand, with securities dealing on another hand, insurance underwriting on yet another hand and all manner of other kinds of financial dealing. So what we saw then by the end of the Clinton period and Larry Summers period was a completely transformed financial landscape wherein the largest institutions conducted all sorts of financial operations and there were fewer and fewer of them as time went on, right? You'll remember that it wasn't long ago at all that we would talk about the big eight banks and then we started talking about the big six and the big four and who knows, probably by next week, it'll be the big three or something. But <laughs> the way things are going for sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the difference that made, Christian, was that if you're a giant sort of megalith of that sort, you're not particularly interested in the kind of cute little Kansas City or uh, let's say Warrensville, Missouri, small businesses that Mark Twain Bank or Boatman's Bank might have been interested in. You're looking at global capital markets and you're looking at the derivatives markets and other secondary financial markets and you're looking for opportunities to make a quick buck by making good bets or gambles on price movements, which are usually good bets for the principals involved because they usually have inside information and they belong to a fairly small little clique of traders, right? So And somehow it's legal. Yeah, somehow it's legal. And even when it's not legal, there there seems to be so many ways to get around it that it might well not be illegal. And so that's, of course, completely changed then the orientation of banking. It's really, I think, been, it's been, in a sense, a critical part of the mechanics of what we popularly call financialization, right? The financialization of the U.S. economy, really, it began earlier than that, of course, probably during the Reagan years, but it really picked up steam and really accelerated to reach a kind of critical mass during those late Clinton years. And that makes a huge difference, right? Because, of course, during that same period, um, the U.S. has deindustrialized, has sort of ceased in in large part to be an economy where people make things. Union scale jobs, accordingly, have disappeared, and inequalities have widened. Right between those who basically make their money via these large financial institutions and the gambling that they do, on the one hand, and all the rest of us, great unwashed, who used to work in manufacturing industries or associated service industries, on the other hand. And you call those in your piece or in your writing elsewhere on Forbes, you call those aspects the secondary and tertiary parts of the investment economy, if you will. Exactly. And we'll come back to that towards the end when we talk about your draft legislation. In that Forbes piece, you go on to write about this change that happened in the 90s, this consolidation, then puts a regional or specialized bank like Silicon Valley Bank, for instance, it puts them in a bit of a quandary. Could you talk about that? Yeah, sure. So the great advantage for productive purposes of the older regime of banking was you had a great deal of sector specificity and regional focus or regional orientation. What that meant was that lending banks could provide all sorts of helpful sort of consultative services 
to the small businesses and the startups and the small family farms, insofar as those still exist, that would bank with them, right? And so they could help them develop their business plans and make those plans pan out. Um, and they were pretty good at determining who the good risks were and who the bad risks were because they could bask around in the community for how reliable this person was or that person was or this business was or that business was. And that was the sort of the benefit or one of the advantages that came of that. Additionally to the fact that meant that banking was basically focused on making rather than gambling. But the quandary comes with the fact that in the contemporary American economy, the sector specificity brings with it, or actually regional focus as well, brings with it a certain risk that we can think of as in effect concentration risk. But in this case, it's not the concentration of the industry or of the banks, but it's concentration of the loan portfolio, right? So if you're specializing in tech loans in the way that SBB was, well, then that means if there's a sort of sector-wide problem, as there has been in tech ever since Powell began insanely raising rates, um, then of course, you've got more at risk, so to speak, right? You're not as diversified in your portfolio if you're concentrating in particular sectors or particular regions of the country or what have you. And so in a way, there's a sort of a trade-off, right? You trade off a little bit of safety or at least diversification capacity in return for the expertise that comes with that sort of sector specificity. And what that does then is it presents a quandary to a particular business, right? A business that wants to make things or somebody who's forming a startup that is going to produce things or make things. They can do their banking with a bank that actually understands their industry and understands their goals and what they're trying to do and can invest patient capital, as we might call it, in them, which SVB was doing, right? SVB would often make loans uh, to tech firms in the full knowledge that there might not be any profits realized by these firms for three, four, five years. All of that's the good side of a bank like that. But then the downside is that at least in the absence of adequate deposit insurance, there's the possibility that the bank can get into trouble precisely because it's not gigantic and it's not implicitly guaranteed by the federal government. It's not, in other words, TBTF. And it's also because it's not as big as the world itself. It can't be diversified across millions of different industries, right? So in effect, you're confronted with a Hobson's choice if you're a startup company. You can find safety for sure for the entirety of your deposits, irrespective of deposit insurance, which of course is capped at the time for the time being at 250K. Even if you have a larger account than that, if you maintain it at one of the big four banks, you're fully covered, you're fully safe in effect, because everybody knows that they're never, the feds are never going to let one of those banks go down. So you can get the safety there, but then you sort of sacrifice for that safety, the aforementioned sector specificity and expertise in, in your particular region or your part of the country and your particular industry or what you're all about. Now, before the SVB collapse a couple of weeks ago, a lot of firms were making the trade-off in favor of that sector specificity, right? In other words, a lot of them were keeping large accounts that exceeded the federal deposit insurance cap in return for the patience of the patient capital that would be lent out by those sector-specific banks on the one hand, and again, the sort of regional and sector expertise that those firms could offer uh, on the other hand. I just want to jump in and say, yeah, now we're on to SVB. In terms of institutional imperatives, you do write in your Forbes piece about how SVB, or maybe it's an earlier piece I'm referring to, actually, but you write about how SVB was doing precisely what people think banks should be doing in the wake of 2008. Yeah, like for the last five Forbes columns that I put out, all of them since the SVB collapse, are all about this basic problem from various angles. And the one that I think you're alluding to is the very first one that where the title even included the phrase boring bank and scare quotes, because SVB was exactly the kind of bank that Paul Krugman was calling for us to return to after 2008. He said, it's time for banks to be boring again. And by that, he meant banks that just basically make loans in fields that they have expertise in and hold those loans to maturity on their books and then maybe invest any additional that they have. And if, if there's inadequate demand to lend out all of the working capital that they've got, then they just put the rest in U.S. Treasury securities, which are the safest of all the safe assets and considered so safe that they get a zero risk weighting under the risk-based capital standards. And that's what BB did, right? I mean, in effect, it was the portfolio was one part industrial loans of the kind that we like to see banks extending 
And then one part microcosm of the Fed portfolio, ironically enough, right? Because the Fed portfolio is basically Treasury Securities and AAA rated MBS. And that's what SVB had done with the remainder of its funds that it hadn't put into sort of ordinary tech loans. So, or actual industrial loans in the tech sector. So, the irony, one of the great ironies is that SVB was sort of boring bank. But now what we're learning, of course, or at least what's being high lit, is that being a boring bank is not necessarily being a safe bank, at least under under current conditions, right? And so that's the quandary that the depositors face. And it wasn't as salient to them before SVB began to falter a bit thanks to the sudden interest rate hikes that, that Powell had neared. Uh, but now it's more salient. And so what we see happening right before our eyes is that there's a mass exodus underway where people are pulling their money out of their deposits with sector-specific or local or industrial banks and putting it in to those safer, supposedly safer banks that are safe simply because they're too big for the feds to allow to fail. And we're moving on to the bank run now. And before we do any more specifics with uh, SVB, I'm really interested in how you coined this category earlier in maybe 2013. You, you say that bank runs are an example of a recursive collection action problem. Could you talk about that? Yeah. So recursive collective action problems are essentially like any other collective action problem, only with feedback effects. So, you know, the hallmark of a classic collective action problem is it's a situation where multiple acts of individual rationality aggregate into an act of collective irrationality or collective calamity, right? And they're surrounded by examples of this all the time, right? An arms race is an example. So basically, you would be irrational not to keep up with the person who's arming against you. You have to, I suppose, counteract every act with some sort of checkmating or neutralizing act. And so each party is, in a certain sense, doing the rational thing by responding to the other party. But then between the two of them, they're just doing enormously wasteful things by putting more and more money into weapons systems whose very purpose is to ensure that those weapon systems themselves never get used, right? Or the old, somebody shouts fire in the crowded theater, so everybody runs for the door. Well, yeah, and it, it's, it rhymes with the paradox of thrift as well, doesn't it? That it's what's good for the individual. It, it can't possibly work for the whole. Exactly. So the, the paradox of thrift just is another example of a collective action problem of this kind. The only thing that the recursion adds is it's a sort of an iterated repetition of the problem. And a ratchet, I guess. It only goes in one direction. And so each move in the game, so to speak, is a response to the previous move in the game. And so the underlying irrationality, the underlying collective irrationality just intensifies. It gets worse and worse. It's self-augmenting. And a bank run, of course, is one of the most prominent examples of this in the financial space, at least. And similarly, a depression, right? A, a Great Depression. or And similarly, a consumer price inflation or a bubble. It's the same sort of problem operating in the opposite direction. Instead of fire sale of assets or running on a bank, you're sort of running in to the point where you're driving prices up in a kind of crazily irrational way collectively. I mean, if you notice that the price of bread is going up every few days, then you're probably going to buy more bread today rather than putting it off until tomorrow because that's individually rational. You get it cheaper now than later, but everybody else is doing the same thing. And so they basically add to the demand and they drive the price up even higher and even faster. And then it just builds on itself and gets worse and worse. And that's effectively what a bank run is. And that's what a bank run was back in 1933 when the U.S. was seeing a cascade of bank failures. And so when Roosevelt took office, back in those days, the president was inaugurated in March rather than January. And in Roosevelt's sort of famous first inaugural address, he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And people quote that now as so we're just a cute sort of rhetorical flourish. It sounds interesting or cool. So you repeat it. But he actually wasn't simply engaging in a bit of sort of rhetorical sleight of hand. He meant something quite literal there, and that was that the bank runs that were underway as he was taking office were in the nature of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And what that means, in other words, then, is that fear was driving it. And so the thing to do, the thing that was necessary in order to stop the thing from happening was to end the fear, right? The fear was the driver rather than simply the response. It was both because this was a symbiotic process. And of course, how did he stop the fear? Well, declared a bank holiday and rushed through legislation to establish federal deposit insurance. And so now nobody had to feel like if they weren't the first in the queue at the first sign of trouble for a bank that they would somehow lose their deposit. And once nobody had to fear that any longer, then nobody ran right on the banks. And so the deposit insurance becomes 
something a bit like nuclear weapons, only in a more virtuous sense this time. And that is that if you do it right, then the whole purpose of it is not to have to use it. You put it in place and then you won't need it because nobody actually does, nobody embarks on the sort of self-fulfillingly prophetic running in the first place. And so it was brilliant, right? And banking in consequence, at least garden variety, plain vanilla banking, remained safe for 90 years almost thereafter, right? But when we come to the present, of course, which I know you'll bring us to shortly, we find that the system is a little bit long of tooth insofar as the caps on coverage are such as to leave a lot of deposits now effectively uninsured, which wasn't supposed to happen. To be fair, in the case of SVB, there's plenty of blame to go around. We talk a lot about Fed uh, raised rates very sharply, but you've also written elsewhere that uh, SVB's management failed to hedge against interest rate risk on treasuries. Can you talk about that? Sure. There was a bit of a boneheaded quality to some of what the management did over there. You've probably read that their risk management department was itself headless. The former head of the department had left and moved on and I think for something like a year, they still hadn't found a replacement for this person. So they were a little bit asleep at the switch when it came to risk management. And ordinarily, a risk management department that's worth its salt is looking at and hedging against the possibility of interest rate risk. And SVB didn't do that. And that, again, was a fault on their part. But to some extent in their defense, so as not to pile on, I mean, it's worth noting that the rate hikes that Powell has engineered are the most rapid that we've seen in 45 years, 450 basis points in a year is almost force majeure, right? It's almost uh, like an act of God, which maybe Powell would love to hear. But, you, you know, the, the hikes are wrong for multiple reasons as well, but it is just another one of them, yeah. Exactly. If there was something that you were going to miss, this might have been it, right? Because, again, it's been almost literally the gold standard, right, to keep U.S. Treasury securities as your sort of safe asset, as the safest place to park surplus. Over the last 45 years, any time until uh, a year or so ago, that would have been essentially a riskless proposition. And my guess then is that when SVB did not put a head in charge of the risk management department for all of that time, that was precisely the period during which the rate hikes occurred. So you could see how that might have been missed. And then once they did start to take corrective action, well, then that sent a signal to the market that they're worried. And that's what sort of sparked the run. And there's some anecdotal reports to the effect that there might have been short sellers who were trying to trigger a run anyway, because they would then benefit by a collapse of the bank, or at least a collapse of its stock. I won't name names, but there are some prominent names that have been mentioned in this connection. And in consequence, the DOJ is now investigating, and who knows what they'll come up with. But either way, I mean, yeah, I mean, strictly speaking, SVB would have been much better to hedge against interest rate risk. But uh, again, I don't want to put too much weight on that because it seems very few people expected anything like that to happen. What would be a, a way for a bank to hedge against interest rate risk? Well, one way to do it is in a gradual way, as rates are beginning to rise, to sort of, you know, kind of quietly switch out, right? Trade off some of the treasuries that you have for new treasuries, which were offering a higher rate, right? The, their strategy was to hold these things to maturity because if you hold them to maturity, they have a higher yield. But the problem was that yield was swamped when rates started leaping up, right? Because basically the way that the valuation techniques work that traders use and when it comes to sort of valuing securities, you always have to value an existing portfolio of securities, including fixed income instruments like U.S. Treasuries, relative to available alternatives, right? And in effect, what happens to the treasuries in SVB's portfolio was that they temporarily became less attractive because now there were higher yielding alternatives in the face of the rate hikes. Over time, of course, those securities still would have turned out to be fine. And uh, assuming that the rate hikes will be reversed before long, as, the, as Powell finally learns that this is not a wage and salary driven inflation, such that rate hikes are a waste of time. No, he's a pretty slow learner. That uh, seems to be. <laughs> and a, a sophisticated risk management department would have been able to come up with ways to hedge, uh, again, in a kind of a way that would unfold gradually over time as the rates were going up, even in real time. So what we ran through there was what I understand is the mark to market accounting, I guess you'd call it. And there's actually no need to do that, as I understand it. Like what caused the portfolio to present as, I guess, unbalanced to regulators is they had to realize the unrealized losses, right, in order to sell treasuries. The big picture here, big picture story here at the backdrop, I guess you could say, is that we do not generally require banks to mark their portfolios to market 
because the banking model is such that you think of the loan portfolio or the asset portfolio as a longer term thing, right? And then you think of the liability side of the balance sheet as a shorter term thing. And that's just the model of banking, right? Borrowing short and lending long and then pocketing difference, right? They used to have an old formula, it was 363, right? The idea is you borrow at 3%, i.e. pay 3% to your depositors. Ha ha, remember, <laughs> I don't think either of us is old enough to remember when that was last done. But in any event, assuming that old model was still in place, the, it was 363 in the sense that you gave 3% to your depositors, you lent out at 6%, and then you pocketed the 3% difference as your profit margin. Later, that came to be bastardized as 363 basically pay out to your depositors at 3%, lend out to your borrowers at 6%, and go to the golf course at 3%. Yeah, right. And because that's the banking model, it makes sense to require banks to be constantly updating the market value of their portfolios, because it's understood that those portfolios fluctuate over time. And the main thing that you're looking for then when it comes to a bank portfolio is assuming that you don't have a bunch of defaults on the actual loans in the portfolio, assuming that the loans all perform and that the securities that are the balance of the portfolio also perform, then you know, you're going to be fine at the end of the term of each particular loan or each particular bond instrument or other security that you're holding in that portfolio. Another way to put this is to say that we don't expect banks, we don't want to subject banks to the vagaries of market volatility. Because as you and I both know, especially if we've read chapter 12 of the general theory, the sort of rapid fluctuations in the markets can happen without warning. And sometimes the volatility, i.e. the amplitude between the sort of peaks and the trials could be quite, quite significant. But it's understood that they all those changes occur around a mean, and it's the mean that you care about when you're thinking in terms of the long term rather than the immediate term. Just on interest rates, this is tangential, but maybe parallel at the same time. You know, if you read the business press around right about the time of a central bank rate setting meetings like we've had this week, the pundits will say, oh, the Fed or the Bank of England, they've got a tough balancing act to pull off. Do they not raise rates and let inflation get out of hand? Or do they raise rates and cause a recession? And it's really tricky and complicated. And they do that in every case except Japan, right? <laughs> and it, Because the Bank of Japan's looked at that tough balancing act and solved it. They've gone, look, whatever our nation's problems, they're not going to be solved by raising unemployment. We're not going to bring prices down by making credit more expensive. We're not going to solve income inequality by paying interest income to people who already have money. So they have a zero interest rate policy and yield curve control. And it works, right? They've got low inflation, low unemployment. The rest of the world's business press, not interested in how they've done that. They'll obsess over what happened four decades ago. Like, did the Volcker shock work? It was tough, but we might need to revisit it. But they will refuse to get curious about a currently existing real world success story. And I really blame the financial press for that because it's just, it has a bearing on the public interest. And the only time they report on Japan is to say things like, just how long can the Bank of Japan hold on to yield curve control? You know, if you're an MMT, you're like, the answer is, well, forever. You know, they did say, hold my beer, right? I mean, <laughs> you have to watch and learn, right? I mean, it is striking, isn't it? How there, there are two economies that have done relatively well in the sort of, on the score of keeping inequality rates low, keeping growth rates steady, not terribly high, but at least constant for decades now. And one is Germany and one is Japan. So yeah, I mean, one of the things that they've, that the Germans and the Japanese have done over the decades is treating employees like human beings or treating the workforce like human beings. And so they don't treat, you know, employees like sort of undesirable inventory during a downturn. They just figure other ways to weather the storm or buffer the pain. That's one thing they've tended to do. They've also avoided financialization, right? They've by and large tried to keep their economies production focused and actual manufacturing focused, real economy focused rather than just looking for cheap thrills and short-term profits through various forms of gambling on secondary financial and tertiary derivatives markets. They both basically pursued a completely different, well, I should say completely, but a, a vastly different model of managing an economy than we have. And I think that's one reason that they just don't go through the same sorts of gyrations that we do. So, like I said at the beginning, you've been ahead of the curve on this for a while. We have, we've got these irrational bank runs that we've talked about. And tell us about your solution to these periodic crises and your new draft legislation. 
it's actually surprisingly simple. I mean, this draft bill, and anybody who wants to find it can find it. It's just called the Federal Deposit Insurance Completion Act of 2023. And I'm delighted to be able to report that multiple Republicans and Democrats alike in both the House and the Senate are now working with it. And I think we'll probably end up having bipartisan legislation announced within a few days. It's even shorter than the Glass-Steagall Act, this paragon of efficient legislation, because in contrast to Dodd-Frank, which is thousands of pages long, the Glass-Steagall Act is just a few pages. And this bill is even shorter than that. Basically, what it does is first, it removes all FDIC caps on transaction accounts that are maintained by small businesses or startups or what have you, because these firms have payrolls to make and they have operating expenses on a daily or weekly basis that make chump change of 250K, right? So first, it lifts all of those caps Second, it retains the risk pricing regime that we're already required to employ by law. We're required by law since 2005 to do that. And it prohibits banks from passing on those additional premium costs that would come with the additional coverage to small account holders. In other words, if you're somebody who has an account less than 250 k the bank is not going to be permitted to pass on any of the costs of the additional premiums that they'll have to pay for the insurance to you or me. This bill sort of reinforces or reemphasizes that, first of all, shareholders will indeed be wiped out in the event of any sort of bank trouble. In other words, the insurance pool will not be used to make shareholders or other equity holders whole. Yeah, I really want to just drive that point home that we're not saying there should be no consequences for sucking at being a bank. <laughs> and you've very pointedly written about that. It goes, in fact, I think I'm quoting you now, that it goes without saying, don't rescue the shareholders. Yeah, you don't rescue those. I mean, that's the nature of the equity the bargain, right? As you're saying, look, as a shareholder, I have unlimited upside gain potential here if this bank prospers and does really well. But in return for that, of course, I also face unlimited downside loss potential, at least in the sense that I can lose the entirety of my investment. So you want those folk to be wiped out. And one way, indeed, to keep the banks safer, and it's significant, I think, in this context, that it's the FDIC that has charge of this particular method of keeping the bank safer that I'm about to mention, is to impose a thicker equity buffer, right? You say, if you want to make sure that the bank is even safer than it has been, you just say you'd have to maintain or have to have a higher measure of equity as a percentage of your total asset portfolio. Oh, I think I might just break in there. And if you're happy to answer this, because I think people get confused because we're often, we will say now, looking at how banks work and then the endogenous money view, we go, look, bank lending isn't reserve constraints anymore, but bank solvency is capital constraint. I think that's the right way to say it, but correct me if I'm wrong. That's what will get a bank shut down, basically. It's the capital ratio, not the reserve ratio. That's the most potent regulatory tool because that's what banks actually require, right? They actually need the capital in order to operate at all. And if you simply impose a higher capital buffer, what you're effectively doing is saying that the total asset portfolio is a multiple of that capital buffer. And so if you raise the buffer, the buffer requirement, then in effect, for a given amount of capital, you're shrinking the portfolio. And that's a way of controlling the production of or the dissemination of endogenous money, right? Which is just Excelian credit money. So the final provision of the act of the bill reiterates or reinforces the requirement that the FDIC sue to claw back any suspicious disbursements of that sort. And here's a kicker. This is somewhat unique, I think, in, in relative to recent bank regulations. It also requires the DOJ to investigate those who are the recipients of such disbursements and those who actually conduct such disbursements for fraud, right? Because this is anything that's known as fraudulent conveyance in bankruptcy law. And there's no reason not to treat that as a criminal offense. One of uh, our listeners was, uh, uh, you know, writing to us and asking us about what happened with SVB. And they mentioned that, in his words, it was apparently the CEO dumped stock. You know, obviously, we're just talking it. <laughs> Nobody sue us for defamation. Is, it, is that what's come out, as you understand it? There are some anecdotal reports to suggest that might have happened. But the degree to which any such reports have actually been substantiated at this point is unknown to me. But the very fact that the DOJ is itself investigating seems to be, to be, you know, sort of a good sign, at least in the sense that we're taking the possibility of wrongdoing seriously here through a government organ that doesn't just slap you on the wrist, right? That actually throws you in jail and can impose heavy criminal fines as well. So if it turns out that something like that happened here, then yeah. 
So that's what the bill does. So it's very straightforward and very simple and very easy and obvious. And a piece of history, I think, that's relevant here that I think in a way makes the bill more compelling as something to do is that those caps that we place on coverage currently, I actually think are just vestigial. They're an oversight left over from an earlier regime that we just didn't change when we changed other relevant aspects of that older regime. So before 2005, Christian, the way the federal deposit insurance scheme worked was first, the premiums that were assessed were not risk priced, right? In effect, it was like a health insurance company charging the same to somebody on the Mediterranean diet for health insurance as they would charge to somebody who lives on McDonald's and smokes a pack of cigarettes every hour. And so th that made no sense, right? That's a total recipe. It's not only a recipe for moral hazard, but it's also profoundly unjust, right? Because the prudent banks were in effect subsidizing the imprudent ones. So that was one problem with the previous system. The other problem was that it was quite pro-cyclical, speaking of recursive collective action problems. And what I mean by that to say that basically the way assessment worked was the FDIC would watch the level of the DIF, the Deposit Insurance Fund. And when the fund dropped below certain threshold levels, the FDIC would put in requests for assessments to the various banks saying, oh, the pool's gone down a bit. We need more money from you banks to sort of replenish it. But the reason that that was pro-cyclical, of course, is that about the circumstances that would lead the DIF level to go down it would be correlated bank failures, right? Meaning in turn that it's probably not the best time to be demanding more money from banks because apparently there's banking trouble. It's almost as though Joseph in the story of Joseph and the Pharaoh had said to Pharaoh, instead of making more grain requisitions during the fat years in order to provide for the lean years, you just said to Pharaoh, well, just don't requisition more grain until the grain runs out of the pyramid. And then if that means it's during the seven lean years, then you're saying, okay, make more grain requisitions precisely when everybody is starving already, right? It's a really stupid way to do it. So in, in 2005, we changed the method of assessment to make it more counter-cyclical than pro-cyclical. And we also imposed risk pricing on the insurance premiums. Now, my view, I haven't been able to substantiate this yet with a sort of a thorough dive into the legislative history in 1933, but my bet would be that once I get around to looking at that history, I'll find that the caps, the imposition of the caps was meant to be a, a way of mitigating some of the risk that came with the old method of assessment. And that once we abandoned that old method of assessment and replaced it with something rational in 2005, the caps became something like the human tailbone, right? They just became superfluous. They're vestigial from an earlier time when they made sense, but they don't make sense anymore. And so we might as well just scrap them, given in particular the fact that obviously we're still going to risk price the insurance and obviously we're still going to calibrate the assessment relative to the total deposits that are to be insured, right? So the insured deposits are the denominator of the fraction. And if that denominator is growing, then of course the numerator is going to grow too. That's to say that we're going to charge more in the same way that it costs more to insure a Beverly Hills mansion with homeowners insurance than it does to insure an Ithaca cottage that's worth one one hundredth of the value of a mansion. Yeah, as you say, it's progressively pricing the premium as the deposit amounts grow. That's what insurance companies do, right? I mean, that's why there's an insurance industry that, and why it's turned out to be possible for there to be an insurance industry is we've figured out how to risk price and how to, what sorts of coverage to require and what sorts of charges to, to levy in return for certain levels of coverage, right? We've known how to do that since the 16th century. And like you touched on before, this legislation's before Congress now, and there's bipartisan support, as I understand it, at the time of recording. Have there been any further developments or are we up to date now? How do you see the progress going in the next few weeks? Because I know probably by the time we air this interview in a few days time that I think there's going to be a few congressional hearings on the bank meltdowns and whatnot. I think there's going to be very good news to report, Christian, maybe as early as Monday or Tuesday. Um, wow. Oh, great. Yeah, because we're at a state of the process right now where legislative council is actually formally or officially converting my legislative text into the sort of formatting that's used by Congress when bills are presented, you know, all the kind of fancy lettering and all that kind of stuff and the particular numbering and lettering systems that they use to sort of organize. So they're in the process of doing that now. Legislative councils are doing that now for their respective legislators. And my guess then is that we probably have broad agreement, at least enough to have bipartisan sponsorship and bicameral sponsorship by early this coming week. This is one of those relatively small number of areas where populism on the left and populism on the right sort of converge, right? There's actually a lot of agreement between left-wing and right-wing populists, and 
here's one of those realms. Great. So that's building banks better, as you put it in a lot of your writing. Let's turn the corner now and talk about financialization itself, because financialization sold to us as progress. It's the mark of an advanced economy. But amazingly, like with many purported miracles, there is actually a downside. And you write about that. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I definitely can. And I'm very happy to do so, Kristen, since this is a, another drum, as you noted, that I've been banging for a while and I'm eager to get more and more people to be hearing because it tends to be overlooked, I think, in a lot of the mainstream media. So there is a difference, it seems to me, between actual investment and mere speculation or, again, long-term planting of patient seed capital on the one hand and just looking for quick profits by, again, betting on price movements on the other hand. And the American economy and the American financial sector used to be much more sort of production focused. They used to be much less about betting on price movements and much more about local investment and what looked to be promising new product lines, promising new ways of producing, promising new services that were collateral to or complementary to production. And that's one reason that the U.S. grew so phenomenally as a productive economy from about the 1870s onward. It's actually growing even before that as well. And banks, of course, as I mentioned before, had always been localized in the U.S. until late 1990s. But that's the way it used to be. And that's one reason, I think, then that the U.S. became this sort of very productive society and also one with a more compressed distribution of wealth and income, right? If there were always robber barons and really rich creeps on the one hand and immiserated proletarians on the other hand. But for one thing, the, the, the differentials between those two classes used to be much smaller. And for another thing, it was possible thanks to labor legislation that was passed at various uh, or various sort of intervals in our history, uh, essentially for labor to unionize and then collectively bargain. And so when it was still a manufacturing country, you actually had pretty high livable wages, and it was even possible for entire families to live on the income of one breadwinner. I think people forget that, that now it takes two people's income to have the same, you know, in real terms. And when I was growing up, my mom was always at a job as well, but it was sort of optional for her, right? I mean, she had this amazing career that was really remarkably creative and had a very interesting childhood because of my mom's interesting careers. But the thing that was great about that was that was because my mom loved what she did in its own right. It wasn't like coercive, so to speak. It wasn't like we can't live in the manner to which we're accustomed unless mom is working full time. And like you said, right, you could imagine that very easily in those days, if it hadn't been for the more rampant nature of the more pervasive quality of sexism in those days, even than now, that two parents might have worked half time, or maybe one would have worked to do doing only what she or he loved, even though it wasn't very remunerative provided that the other one was doing something that was remunerative. But it was very easy, right, for a single income to put a whole nuclear family's worth of kids for college too, right, two or three children, whatever. And that's, of course, just disappeared with the sort of widening of the spread between the very top and all the rest. And that's directly connected to financialization, of course, because that which makes that top 1% and somewhat more the top 10% so wealthy is precisely the fact that they're all rentiers, right? They simply own financial assets that keep going up in value thanks to QE and other sort of conspiratorial policies that are sort of pursued by our financial regulators, especially the Fed, that are all designed basically to inflate the value, the market value of various financial assets. And so that's the kind of economy we are. And there's an irony because the people in the financial quote unquote services sector will justify this because they'll say it's the biggest sector of the economy, right? A big chunk of our economy is now a quarter of it is accounted for by this. So this is our great success. Like, like it so just why? happened. Like, yeah, these are constructs that we can change if we want. Yeah. yeah. As if we didn't engineer that. And furthermore, as if it weren't the case that only a tiny portion of the population is actually working in that sector. So in effect, what they're telling us when they say 25% of GDP is accounted for by the financial sector is they're saying, 25% of the GDP goes to about 12 people. Not something to be boasting about, right? It seems to me and it shouldn't be regarded as a success, let alone a triumph, which is the way people like Jamie Dimon will often describe it. So my, as you know, another drama I've been banging for a while then, and these two things are intimately connected, I think, in the ways that we've effectively been talking about here, is to bring back an economy that is production focused and that's patient capital using rather than short term profit capital using, but also in, in a better form than we had it before. I mean, it was, there were various good things about it before in the sense that unionization in the productive sectors 
resulted in a bigger piece of the surplus going to labor than had been the case decades earlier or in the, say, mid-19th century. But we can improve even on that, for one thing, by moving in the direction of more worker ownership and more worker co-determination on corporate boards and the like. I think the next book that I have coming out, which will probably be out later this year with Yale University Press, is about how to engineer that, right? What kinds of legal changes have to be made in order to make it a lot easier for people to start their own businesses as either individuals or as groups of workers and form essentially labor co-ops that then become startup companies that are owned by their own workers. That'll be an even better version, I think, of what we had before. And it's not difficult at all to do this, right? I'll just jump in there and say, now, I know that like we're the MMT podcast, we're full MMT. And uh, I think I'm right in saying that you are a fellow traveler, very closely aligned, but not necessarily full MMT. And from my perspective, I see the job guarantee could really work here because whatever you do, you know, whether worker co-ops spring up or the government starts a fund to stimulate green investment or something like that, what happens to people when they lose their jobs changes with the job guarantee. They've got this option to stay liquid as a worker, to keep the skills liquid and not worry about where the next meal's coming from. And I, I think that can work in tandem with the, whatever you're proposing there. Oh, I think it definitely can, right? I mean, one way to think about that is as essentially a guarantee that there will never be a reserve army of the unemployed, right? And I think here's a case where Marx was just spot on correct, right? I mean, and I think that's a big part of what explains why Larry Summers has been urging the Fed to raise the rates and why Jay Powell's raising the I mean, as you and I know, and as we've talked about before, the inflation rate or CPI rate is much higher than the growth rate of wages and salaries. And at the same time, it's much lower than the growth rate of profits of late. And as I keep saying to other folk, you don't have to be Jacob Bernoulli to figure out which of those then is probably the cause. It's usually the leading indicator that's the cause, not the trailing indicator. And so the only way to explain, uh, it seems to me, Larry Summers and Jay Powell's interest in raising rates, which works essentially by throwing more people out of work, is that they're trying to tame labor, right? They want, they, they're basically disturbed that the reserve army of the unemployed has gotten too small. And so there's no disciplining of labor. And so we have to, they've gotten uppity, right? The laborers. And so we have to scare them, put the fear of God, i.e. the Fed, again, into them by throwing them out of work, by raising the rates, and then they will trim their demands to be paid properly in a way that they can live on. And then that will enable the profits that are pocketed by the 1% to grow even larger. And they can continue to enjoy their little holiday that they've enjoyed for several decades now. And so, yeah, I'm, I've got a piece out even from some years back called Open Labor Market Operations that just analogizes this to OMO in the same way like Minsky or Kaleski would have done. And as you noted, I am a fellow traveler. I think of myself as a sort of a left-wing Vixelian, right? And we've talked about that before, too, where Vixel was the first, I think, highly mathematically-minded formalizer of the idea of endogenous money and its significance. And we've, of course, bastardized him in the same way that we've bastardized Keynes and bastardized pretty much every other interesting economic thinker of the past. But a key significance of, I think, the Vixelian bank money view here or endogenous money view here is it essentially shows you precisely how to make it possible for more firms to be worker-owned. And it's basically this, right? The only reason that we have capitalist firms now, i.e. firms that are owned by capital, is because capitalists have been able to keep capital itself in short supply and thus to demand higher rents for enabling us to use their capital. And among the higher rents that they charge are effectively, they say, we have to own the firms and we employ you rather than you employing us. But as soon as we recognize that a sort of money shortage or a Vixelian credit money shortage is an engineered shortage, it's engineered by a Larry Summers type in the same way that the higher unemployment rate that we're about to see is being engineered by them. As soon as you recognize that, then you also recognize that we can engineer it in the opposite direction, right? And as you know, a lot of the a lot of the stuff I published in the last few years, including the building banks better that you mentioned before, is all about how to enable the public to retake control of public capital, which is essentially what credit money is under a fiat money system that's well managed by public sector institutions, for the public to retake control of public capital and to disseminate that capital or make that capital available on favorable terms to help finance worker-owned co-ops and the like, basically taking the power away from those rentiers. Very easy to do. It's all schematized and 
this forthcoming book, but you already basically know the schematization, I think, Christian, because it's all written out and all of those were recently published papers of mine since 2018, 2019 or so. On this topic, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this because it's a UK thing. We have a firm called British Steel. It's owned by a Chinese company and we have Tata Steel, which is based in Britain. That's part of an Indian company. So we've got steel producers in this country owned by non-resident firms, I guess you'd say, or multinational firms. These companies are also heavily subsidized by millions of pounds of domestic public money and they're... I mean, I'm trying not to say bribe, but you know, I think there's a news story at the moment that it's on the table that the government will pay £300 million apiece as an incentive for them to not close their plants down and quote-unquote keep the jobs in the country. And my point is, if we think Britain's going to benefit from having that production done domestically, keeping those jobs in Britain through the MMT lens, the government has the pounds to invest in those things now. and It doesn't need to attract them from oligarchs, investors from other countries. It doesn't need to set up a sovereign wealth fund like our Labour Party in the UK are proposing to do for green energy. So they mean well, but like there is an infinite wealth fund. <laughs> it's called the government. And so especially if an industry is strategically important, there's no need to have these businesses to be even part owned by a foreign company. I'm not trying to be xenophobic here. I'm just thinking it's because investment means ultimately the investor sure is putting money in, but you call it investment because they're going to be taking out more money than they're putting in ultimately, right? Otherwise, it would be called charity. So uh, as I see it, the government are paying millions of pounds of public money to, say, an Indian or a Chinese company to help them set up a flow of profit from the UK to those countries more specifically, the elites in those countries. So it's not even, okay, we might do something nice for ordinary people. And so there's just no reason for it. So, you know, if the labor and the real resources to do the production are here in the UK already, I would say look, we don't need foreign investment to mobilize those things. I am just puzzled by the way foreign investments covered in the press as a win or quite often. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. I do. I mean, could anything be more abject or pathetic? I mean, it reminds me of various tales that we've all read about, uh, oh, look, cities or countries that have been in distress during times of calamity, including war, where there are always these sort of dreadful stories where people are so desperate that they have to go to blood banks and sell their own blood in order to survive, or they have to sell their bodies on the streets because there's no other way to earn a living or get any money. This is These sorts of images are a staple of lots of 19th century literature where the stories are set in, say, Victorian London or 19th century St. Petersburg in Russia. You know, Dostoevsky novels are full of this sort of imagery. I'm reminded of nothing so much as that when I stories about cities or countries trying to bribe or desperately batting their eyelashes at and lifting their pantaloons to try to attract foreign investment or something. It's just pathetic. And like you, not to be xenophobic, I mean, welcome any capital, but you don't have to flirt for it when you can actually disseminate it yourself, right? And there are plenty of people who know how to run businesses and run productive units in the British Isles, just as there are everywhere in the world. And why not do it that way? <laughs> of course, the usual argument we're going to hear, uh, somebody's going to say, yeah, but that involves all this government expenditure, which means it's going to be inflationary. But what they're always leaving out there is if you're actually talking about financing production, then you're financing essentially the means of absorbing the additional monies. Because if it's a relation between money supplies and good supply as well, if you have a corresponding increase in the goods supply to the increased money supply, then there's no inflationary effect, whatever. Instead, you've written about this in your way, and I think Fidel Kabouv nailed it. He's got this aphorism. Look, if we're pushing up against our productive capacity, that's good news because guess what? Productive capacity is producible. But that's the thing, right? Exactly. And so there's this weird tendency to treat productive capacity as exogenously given in the same way that Ricardian political economists of the 19th century would treat so-called comparative advantage as exogenously given. And sure, if the only goods that trade in the world are grapes and wine on the one hand and sheep and wool on the other, well then yeah, I guess Portugal does have to specialize in the wine and the British Isles do have to specialize in the wool. 
But if that's not really the lion's share to get another animal into this act, that, that the lion's share of credible goods, and if the lion's share is actually stuff that we produce out of various raw materials, then the comparative advantage is more a matter of choice than fate, right? And I think it's the same way when it comes to, it's just a variation on the same claim to note that productive capacity, as, as Faudel aptly puts it, is, is itself producible, right? It's a matter of choice, not fate. And it's not exogenous, in other words. So we've sorted out industrial policy and we've sorted out banking and we've got our fingers crossed for the speedy passage of the Federal Deposit Insurance Completion Act of 2023. Before we wrap up, Robert, knowing how prolific you are, do you have any books or papers or events in the pipeline online or otherwise that folks listening can get excited about or anything that's not been getting the attention it should? I actually do, Christian. Thanks so much for asking. I'll send you a few in case you want to post them, but there are maybe a few things just to mention really quickly. One is that a bill, another draft bill that I put together back in 2020 called the National Reconstruction and Continuous Development Act of 2021 has now been officially co-sponsored in Congress by Republican Senator Marco Rubio. Uh, and Democratic House member Rokana. So I'll send you that bill so that you can see, in essence, what these two Congress members have agreed ought to be done. Once again, it's a case where you have somewhat populistically leaning people on either side of the aisle who agree that production is a good thing and agree that there are there is there are certain uh, functions that have to be discharged that uh, have to be collectively discharged if you're going to do production in a smart way. And so what this does essentially is it reorganizes some of the existing organs of the U.S. federal government on the one hand and upgrades one particular organ, the Federal Financing Bank within Treasury on the other hand, to enable a kind of coherent regional planning or regional sort of mapping out of production needs, new industries that are needed and what is required to make it possible for them to get started and get going. So that's one thing I'd recommend. Another, of course, is the bill itself that you mentioned. And then there's a paper I put up that is sort of a compliment. It kind of complements the bill itself, and it's just called universal deposit insurance. And then thirdly, another thing I've been pushing for a little bit now recently, I think you and Patricia and I might have even talked about this a year or so ago, is essentially enabling the Chicago Fed to trade monitoring markets in the same way that the New York Fed does and others, essentially to short commodities, to keep prices down when they're irrationally high or when they're temporarily high, and to floors underneath them, essentially, again, to put them within a collar so that you maintain a kind of price stability there. Yeah, you like it's a reserve army of unemployed commodities. Precisely, right? So it's a way that the Chicago Fed could do what Keynes recommended in the 40s in the form of a global commodity store. And then finally, fourthly, maybe I'll just mention two forthcoming books. So one of the forthcoming books, it's either going to be called A Republic of Producers or A Republic of Owners. And that's the one I alluded to before about ways to sort of financially engineer at the federal level, a sort of financial system that assess worker-owned firms to flourish. And hence a kind of a long-term switch from what I call capitalism to what I call laborism. One way to define capitalism, of course, actually, you can almost look at any firm as a kind of a co-op. And what kind of co-op it is, it is essentially determined by the basis for voting power or voting rights, right? So if you belong to an agricultural cooperative like Ocean Spray, your voting power within that cooperative tracks the amount of cranberries that you contribute to the common pool of Ocean Spray cranberries. And that would be then a producer's co-op or an agricultural co-op. A corporation of the kind that we know today can be thought of as a capital co-op, right? You contribute money capital and then your voting power tracks that. So if you put in more money capital, you get more shares and you get more voting power. Well, what I'm thinking is what we need to do is move toward a system that has more laborism in it, where essentially labor contribution is what determines your voting power within the firm. And again, we would have had that a long time ago if we hadn't allowed the capitalists to maintain an artificial shortage of capital, which enables them then to essentially to extract rents from us. And one of the rents that they extract is an insistence that they get to own the firm, right, rather than our forming our own firms and then having access to abundant capital. So this coming book, this book will be out fairly soon, and this is basically on how to do that, how to engineer a sort of laborist economy and transform the capitalist economy into a laborist economy. And then the other one is a book version of a long, long article of mine that I put out back in 2009 that, somewhat surprising to me, has become something of a, a widely read article, notwithstanding the fact that it's about a sort of obscure topic, but it's called Bretton Woods 1.0, and it's about how to do a 21st century version 
of Keynes's original plan for what became the IMF. The Bancor plan, right? It, exactly, yeah. Well, essentially, the International Clearing Union with the Bancor is a true global currency. So this Bretton Woods 1.0, which is deliberately ironically titled, it's essentially, let's have a do-over. Let's go back to 1944. Let's follow the Keynes plan rather than the Harry Dexter White plan. But let's do it using contemporary platform technologies. So it'll be digitized. It'll be kind of like a CBDC type thing, but it'll be global. And so that's coming out as a book probably early next year. And those are a couple of things maybe if anybody's interested that they might want to kind of look out for. Wow. I just knew there would be a ton of stuff there because you're pretty much, uh, you know, the hardest working man in this field. So <laughs> it's so fun. You know what I mean? It's like some stuff is so exhilarating that it doesn't even feel like work. It's just, it's energizing in its own right. So it affords the energy that you actually need to do it. It is itself a source of the energy because it's just so fun to do. So it's exciting to work on. That's a great place to leave it. I've been speaking to Professor Robert Hockett, and I'll link to where you can stay current with his work and to where you can get hold of his books in the show notes for this episode. And also, please check out the show notes, because if any of the stuff we've talked about here has left you with questions, there'll be links to Robert's other episodes. There'll be links to other episodes as well and articles which will hopefully answer those questions. And also there'll be a link to where you can get free tickets to the book launch of the new anthology MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers, which takes place in London on the 20th of April. Me and Patricia will be there. She'll be back from her tour of Scotland. <laughs> so me and Patricia will be there. We hope to see you there. But for now, Thanks so much for joining me once again today on the MMT podcast, Professor Robert Hockett. Thank you so much, Christian. Just really stimulating and a joy as always. Thank you so much. That was the MMT podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino, and you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.